Okay, all right. Well, hello, everybody. So today our topic is Durkheim, the collective consciousness and free will. So this is a continuation of our you know, previous conversations about Durkheim, specifically uh, our conversation about utilitarianism and the utilitarian argument that we are all essentially individuals that pursue our own self-interests, you know, through uh, rational weighing of costs and benefits. Uh, Durkheim makes the case that we can see evidence for the fact that that's not true in the way that we react to deviance. Um, so if in the previous video, we talked about how uh, societies are bound together by the sense of morality. And when there are, when individuals within those groups break the moral rules, others, uh, other members of the group will react with very strong emotions to punish uh, the deviant. And so I want to expand a little bit uh, on that today, uh, specifically to talk about the collective consciousness. It's also referred to in different spaces as the collective conscience. So it sounds very similar, but I, I prefer the term collective consciousness, even though collective conscience uh, you probably run into more often. I just like collective like consciousness because it's a broader term uh, and I think it does a better job of covering what Durkheim means. But the collective consciousness for Durkheim uh, consists of ways of acting, thinking, and feeling external to the individual and endowed by the power of coercion by reason of which they control him. Uh, so this is a, a fairly complicated, uh, very often misunderstood phrase. So when you see the word consciousness, you know, we think about our consciousness as our awareness, our ability to, to think and be aware of the world in which we exist. Uh, uh, but we don't think about that as being something that's collective. We think of our own consciousness as our own. You know, I know what I am aware of. I know what I am thinking about, what I am feeling, what I'm experiencing. Uh, and that's mine at the individual level. But Durkheim makes the case, excuse me, Durkheim makes the case that there is this collective consciousness that binds people and groups together. This is a metaphor. He doesn't literally mean that there's some kind of like collective mind or some kind of weird spirit that exists that binds people together in this mystical way. Uh, this is more metaphorical. Uh, so it's like this shared consciousness among members of groups that's within every individual but because it's shared across individuals, it's collective. I know it's a bit weird uh, and kind of tough to wrap our, our heads around, but it is a pretty key concept and I'm hoping it, it'll make more sense as we go. So uh, again, the collective consciousness consists of ways of acting, thinking and feeling external to the individual and endowed by the power of co coercion uh, by reason of which they, meaning the ways of acting, thinking and feeling, control him. Uh, and the collective consciousness creates a sense of solidarity create a sense of connection among group members, which we'll talk about. So I wanna break this definition down. So I break it down into three parts. The first deals with this uh, part of the definition where it talks about uh, these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling. So the collective consciousness includes ways of acting. So if you think about uh, you know, any given moment, there are rules governing what you're supposed to be doing. So if we were meeting in a classroom, uh, you all know what your role is uh, as a student. You know that when you walk into the room, you take a chair, take a seat, and you sit down and you look in a specific direction. You look towards the head of the classroom. Uh, you look towards whatever the, the board is or projector, whatever. You generally are going to take out a computer or some uh, you know, notepaper, take some notes, or at least appear to take notes. Uh, you're going to face a particular direction. You're going to talk at particular times according to particular rules. Uh, I'm going to be following rules as well. Uh, uh, and when we enter into the classroom situation, we take on the role. So our individuality, our individual sense of who we are or self-identity gets essentially pushed aside and we step into the role of student or instructor or, you know, whatever. Uh, and we are... Uh, I, I don't want to say trapped. Well, no, I, I will say trapped within those ways of acting, uh, because once we break out of those ways of acting, if we, for instance, instead of uh, you know me lecturing and us discussing and you asking questions, instead we all burst into song. 
Uh, we all started dancing around uh, and then, I don't know, pulling up on the ball on the floor, crying or whatever. We're no longer a classroom at that point. The, the entire um, social order is broken down and we are experiencing what's called anime, which we'll talk about another point. But uh, when we enter into situations, we take on our, our actions, uh, fit the roles that we take on at any given moment. So the way we're acting is part of this collective consciousness. Uh, ways of thinking, so the ways we see and interpret the world. So our understandings of how the world operates are, are come from our social groups. So for instance, uh, when I get sick or you get sick, we don't attribute that illness to some kind of curse that's been put on us by uh, a local witch or by uh, a devil worshiper, or we don't see an, a person who's ill as having some kind of moral failing that God is punishing uh, them for. We see uh, the sickness as coming from a, a biological basis, typically from some sort of bacterial infection or virus and so on. So for instance, we don't tend to interpret the coronavirus as a punishment from some vengeful God. I mean, some people do, but, uh, but even then, they, they are still gonna recognize the, the, the biological reality of this virus, right? But in previous times, people weren't aware of viruses, they, but they still had ideas about what caused illness uh, and those ways of thinking shaped what they did, shape how they saw the world. So if you believe, for instance, that illness is caused by demonic possession, uh, you are going to react by getting an exorcism versus you know, how I'm gonna react uh, by going to the doctor or by going to the pharmacy or whatever. So, but, our, but the important thing is to notice that those understandings come from our societies. People who thought that, or in the past, who thought that illness came, for instance, from demonic possession weren't stupid. That's what they learned from their social groups. Had you learned that, that's what you would think. Uh, it's not like we're any different now. Um, it's just we operate within different uh, social frameworks that give us different information. Uh, and then we see not just ways of acting and thinking, but also feeling. Uh, so we talked about this a bit uh, in the previous video uh, in regards to morality, but our social groups define how we feel in very deep and profound ways. And, and this is something that we're gonna talk about in more depth uh, later on. But just to give you a little hints about this kind of thing. Uh, so for instance, there are what are called feeling rules, which Dirk Henry doesn't talk about, but we'll talk about um, in another context that dictate to us how we're supposed to feel in given circumstances. So there are rules governing how you feel at a funeral, how you feel at a wedding, not just how you uh, appear to feel, but how you actually feel. Uh, and so there is this social regulation that's placed on you know, this most personal of things, our own emotions. Now, what we're really concerned about here uh, for feelings uh, is connected to people's reactions to acts of deviance. So for Durkheim, uh, when individuals violate the you know, appropriate ways of acting or thinking or feeling, um, other members of the group will react emotionally, usually with anger uh, or hostility towards the, towards the deviant person. But anyway, so the collective consciousness first consists of these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling, and they're shared, they're common. Then we have this component of the definition. These ways of acting, thinking, and feeling are external to the individual. Uh, we, uh, I did not create the student role. Now I started school when I was what, four or five years old and I was being trained to be a student. Uh, I, I entered into the world or I entered into a world where the student role already existed. I didn't create it. Uh, I didn't decide what it means to be a, a lecturer or instructor. I don't decide what it means to be a citizen or uh, a um, brother or father or whatever. Um, these are social roles. These are social positions, responsibilities, obligations that are defined for us. You know, I don't decide what the law is before uh, I enter the world. It's external to me. So these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling exist externally to the individual. We enter the world and they exist. We're going to talk about arguments later on that kind of tweak this a little bit. But for right now, that's what Durkheim's arguing. 
And last thing, these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling are endowed by the power of coercion. Uh, in other words, these ways of thinking, acting, and feeling, it, it's not enough that, well, the expectation or the argument here isn't that just that we follow along with what society tells us to do. It's that there are consequences if we break the rules. Now, one of the reasons why I mentioned free will at the beginning of this um, lecture, and I included in the title, is that one of the kind of interesting things that Durkheim points out is that despite the incredibly profound influence of uh, society on us and this collective consciousness on us, we, and especially in the contemporary US and throughout most of the world, uh, modern world, we see ourselves as having this level of freedom and self-control that really for Durkheim is, is an illusion. Um, we see ourselves as free. We see ourselves as being able to make choices for ourselves uh, and having self-control. Uh, but that's really only because we have so internalized this collective consciousness that we, uh, we want what the collective consciousness tells us to want. We want to act in the way that we have been socialized to act. We automatically think in the way that we are supposed to think. We feel the way we're supposed to feel. Uh, and so we, we you know, feel, we believe we're acting individually. We believe we are acting with you know, free will, but in reality, we're conforming to this broader collective consciousness that has imposed itself on us. And we become aware of that when we break the rules. So when we try to move beyond what uh, these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling uh, allow us to do, that's when we are deviants and that's when we will experience pushback and, and punishment that can be very severe. You know, it, the collective consciousness is incredibly important uh, because the collective consciousness, uh, well, first just gives us a way to act in the world, right? When you take that away, what do we have, right? We, we, we need understandings of what we're supposed to do when we get out of bed every day. Um, but in addition to that, the collective consciousness creates this sense of solidarity uh, among members of the group. So solidarity means this, uh, or refers to the sense of connection, uh, this sense of mutual uh, obligation and reciprocal relationships, uh, this sense of we are together, we are one group bound together. Doesn't mean that everybody likes everybody else, doesn't mean that everybody gets along all the time, but it just means that we see uh, one another as members of our group, okay? Uh, and so, yeah, the, the groups are bound together through these shared ways of thinking, acting, and feeling, and through this process of punishing those who violate the rules, okay? With the ultimate message being, you know, we're not as free as we believe ourselves to be. So there's really two things here. So there's the consequences for you know, deviance, uh, uh, and then the implications for our sense of free will, which are, they're both connected, but, you know, there's slightly different strains that are coming up in, in this lecture. Uh, and so now I have a bunch of quotes from Durkheim that are, depending on your approach, probably somewhat depressing um, or really very depressing. Um, so they're really a bunch of very, very depressing quotes from uh, Emil Durkheim. Uh, and so quick side, all of these are taken from uh, the first chapter of his book, Social Facts. So uh, I, I sort of like the way Durkheim writes. Um, I, I think he does a good job uh, in a lot of cases. That's why I'm you know, bringing his, his uh, material directly into this. Um, but I think he makes a lot of good points. And so I wanna you know, point these out here. So first, uh, and again, you know, we wanna think about all this in terms of the collective consciousness. First thing, there is an external order that guides our actions. So he writes, uh, but on that basis, so referring to something he wrote previously, uh, no human events, uh, so yeah. there are, as it were, no human events that may not be called social. Each individual drinks, sleeps, eats, and reasons. And it, it is to society's interests that these functions be uh, exercised in an orderly manner. He's saying that, yeah, all of us have these basic biological needs to drink, sleep, eat, you know, go to the bathroom, all that. Human beings think, uh, but society as a whole, the social group as a whole, has an interest in shaping what each individual does. Uh, society does not function if everyone just acts 
however they want and acts in this kind of anarchic way. So he goes on to write, uh, when I fulfill my obligations as brother, husband, or citizen, right? So he's explicitly referring to these kinds of social roles. Uh, when I execute my contracts, I perform duties which are defined externally to myself and my acts in law and custom. So he's pointing out here that these social roles that we embody and occupy uh, exist externally to us in our laws, in our customs, in our uh, just traditions and so on within our societies. We are socialized to participate in this external order. Uh, he's got this really great line where he writes here, all education is a continuous effort to impose on the child ways of seeing, feeling, and acting from which he could not have arrived spontaneously. So he's referring to babies there. And if you think about babies, uh, they're adorable, but they're also gross. And they were like poop and pee everywhere, uh, including on other people. And like, it's fine. A baby can just poop on whoever they want and and puke on just whoever they want. And people don't tend to get mad at them. Uh, whereas you and I are not allowed to do that. Uh, you know, I've discovered, uh, but for babies, they haven't been socialized, right? Uh, they are, babies do what comes naturally. If a baby needs to go to the bathroom, it goes to the bathroom. If a baby wants to cry, it cries. If a baby uh, wants to sleep, it sleeps. It does not follow social rules. And in a way, that baby really isn't a member of the society at all. Uh, babies are free to break social rules. But over time, there is this relentless pressure on kids to take more and more and more uh, or to conform more and more with the social roles, obligations, duties, and so on that are uh, expected of us. So if you compare a bunch of kindergartners or preschoolers uh, and sitting in a classroom to a bunch of college students, it's a very different group, right? Uh, so the little kids are just running around everywhere, probably talking quite a bit. They're not sitting quietly, they're not focused, whereas college students are deeply socialized and are following the student role really, really well. Um, well, that takes time, that takes training, and there is nothing natural about being a student, acting the way students act. It is decades of relentless pressure to act particular ways. And it's not just that we're trained to be students, but it's everything. It's every aspect of our lives. Uh, we are you know, have this external or order imposed on us. So uh, he writes, from the very first hours of his life, so thinking about a baby, from the very first hours of a child's life, we compel him to eat, drink, and sleep at regular hours. We constrain him to cleanliness, calmness, and obedience. Later, we exert pressure upon him that he may learn proper consideration for others, respect for customs and conventions, the need for work, etc. So that's what childhood is. It's this relentless training in how to be a member of the particular social group that you are a part of, okay? Uh, he refers to this as uh, unremitting pressure. It's constant, it's always there. Uh, eventually that pressure fades um, or we, we feel it less. Um, but we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this social order is coercive. So again, gets back to that line in the definition of collective consciousness about the social order being coercive. Uh, have this line here again, when I fulfill my obligations as brother, husband, or citizen, uh, I perform duties that are defined externally to myself. Uh, he writes over here, if I do not submit to the conventions of society, so if I do not do what society tells me to do, uh, if in my dress, I do not conform to the customs observed in my country and in my class, uh, the ridicule I provoke, the social isolation which I am kept produce, uh, the same effects as punishment in the strict sense of the word. Uh, so just to translate that into you know, more kind of casual speech, uh, what he's saying there is, is that if you go out and, and wander around in the world and you're not following the rules, for instance, for how to dress appropriately or how to act appropriately or how to deal with others appropriately, you are going to be punished in one way or another. Uh, let's take something as simple as clothing, right? The clothing that you wear has very little effect on anyone else. Uh, it really can't physically harm anyone else. Uh, it really, you know, it, it's 
at a rational level uh, what the particular kind of cloth that you are wearing shouldn't have any impact on what other people do if we lived in a world where everyone was just kind of free to do whatever they want. But if I leave my apartment and I walk around all day in a, in a kimono or in a ballerina's tutu and I just act normally otherwise, no one's going to pay attention to anything that I say. No one's going to be able to really interact with me without it being a bizarre thing for them. I'm going to get dirty looks. People are going to yell at me. People are going to accuse me of not taking situations seriously, maybe of mocking them, uh, all because of the particular kind of cloth that I'm using to cover my body. Well, why is it that I can't wear a kimono? I mean, I can wear a kimono. I could go buy one. I could wear it. But it would be weird. And people would be concerned or angry or upset or confused. Uh, you know, think back to the video we watched from Impractical Jokers with the, the, the guys acting uh, inappropriately at a buffet, right? The, the degree of emotional reaction that, that those other uh, customers felt uh, or expressed was really intense. And if you walk around, for instance, if I walk around dressed like a ballerina all the time, people are gonna be constantly laughing or a lot of people are going to be like literally angry at me, like really angry. Um, and that's going to have an impact in the way they act toward me, right? But again, it just comes down to convention. We could just as easily have, uh, have a society where, you know, uh, adult men wear pink tutus. Like that's, a, you know, there's no reason why we couldn't have had that. In fact, in, in previous times, uh, pink was the masculine color for associated with, you know, blood spattered clothing and so on. But that's a something else to talk about but anyway uh, but we feel bound or we are bound by these rules uh, and it, it's even at a more fundamental level too so he points out here uh, I am not obliged to speak French so you know he speaks French so he could walk around speaking a language other than French or he could just speak using his own made-up language but it's not going to get him very far he's going to get a lot of confused people around him, a lot of angry people uh, so I'm not obliged to speak French with my fellow countrymen, uh, nor to use the legal currency, but I cannot possibly do otherwise. So just to function as a member of society, just to get groceries and to get to buy the things that you need to survive, you have to follow the rules of the society that you're in. Okay. So, and if you think about the amount of time you spend on any given day doing anything, try to think at that moment or from moment to moment. Am I acting in accordance with my own wishes or am I acting in accordance with rules that have been imposed on me? Uh, I think for a lot of you, you're gonna realize, oh, I'm acting in accordance with rules that have been imposed on me. But one of the objections that might uh, come to mind is, yeah, so for instance, if I wanna take a class, if I wanna be a student, then I made that decision, right? I decided to become a student. If I want to go out and I want to go grocery shopping, and then I made the decision to go grocery shopping and I made the decision to not wear a tutu and I made the decision to conform. Um, well, that's only partially true uh, because as Durkheim points out that the things that we want, the things that we take as you know, like, this is my decision. I have decided this, for instance, you know, I have decided to be a student. I have decided to wear these kinds of clothes. I have decided to talk with people in this particular way. Uh, those ways of acting, thinking, and feeling that we feel like you know, we want to do, we've, we've just internalized them. So you didn't pop out of the womb with a particular uh, predilection for certain kinds of clothing that we wear in you know, the contemporary United States. Uh, so when you decide, oh, I want to wear this kind of clothing and I don't want to wear the tutu. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to wear a tutu, but the reason why you don't want to wear a tutu is because you were, you grew up in a society that said, no, don't do that. That's not appropriate. So we come to want we come to our, our emotions and our, you know, our sense of what we ourselves want and the choices that we, we want to make are, are so deeply shaped by these internalized rules that we feel as if we are uh, 
making our own choices, when in reality, we're just really acting in accordance with the rules that are laid down for us. Um, and, and again, you, you find this out when you violate those rules. Uh, and sometimes you violate those rules in small ways and there are massive pushback. So uh, he's got this really uh, kind of intense uh, statement that I, I, I like to highlight. Uh, he writes, we are then victims of the illusion of having ourselves created that which actually forced itself from about. So this gets into some stuff we're gonna talk about later and social constructionism and some other things, but the basic drive of this uh, quote for right now is that we as people uh, internalize what our social group tells us is right, uh, tells us the correct way to act, think and feel. We then accept that, uh, those perspectives, those ways of acting. And then when we act you know, freely, we act according to our own wishes. We're really just uh, you know, following the dictates of the societies that we're a part of. Um, so that I, I think from a, especially from a very like uh, contemporary you know, like capitalist, perspective can come off as very depressing and, and, and really you know, kind of unpleasant and like a, almost as like an attack on, on our identity. Um, but it's not entirely depressing though, because if you think about it, uh, we, if we all acted really as pure individuals, you know, like the way the utilitarians say we do or the way we are often taught that you know, we have freedom, whatever, uh, society wouldn't be able to exist. Like there, things wouldn't function, everything would, would break down. Um, so, you know, the reason why we can have uh, sports teams or have jobs or corporations that function uh, or have a sense of community or have a sense of identity, right? Because our identity has come from the groups that we're a part of, uh, comes from the fact that there is this collective consciousness and there are these shared ways of acting, thinking and feeling. And if there weren't mechanisms to keep people in line, then that solidarity would just break down. Um, that uh, if people were just constantly violating the rules, then the the group itself would no longer be able to function because you know the group is built around those rules. And if those rules go away, the group stops existing. Uh, now there are problems social social solidarity that we're, that we're not going to go into a lot of detail with, but I, I do just want to point out uh, quickly that intensive levels of social solidarity uh, can lead to things like fascism or blind obedience or authoritarianism. So for instance, uh, you know, this really intense social solidarity that uh, was, uh, that kind of was uh, emerged in Germany in the 30s and 40s, you know, it gives rise to this kind of like fanatical uh, group oriented uh, focus that leads to things like the Holocaust, right? Um, see similar sorts of things with like cults. Um, that intensity of social solidarity is always a danger, not just in sort of weird historical bizarre times like during you know, the, the rise of the Nazis, um, but we'll probably talk about this, um, but that potential for that drive for social solidarity to just like go in, in really destructive directions uh, can emerge at any point. So, you know, it's not like there's something weird about Germans in the thirties. Like we can, you, know, you, me, any of us, we can find ourselves in situations where um, the group overpowers us mentally and emotionally. And we uh, kind of become something that we don't, ex didn't think of ourselves as. And anyway, that was a bit confusing, but I, the way I just said that. Um, we'll deal with that later though. Uh, for right now, I just want to point out that, yes, the collective consciousness binds us together. Uh, it gives us a sense of belonging. It allows social groups to exist, and it allows us to function in society. Uh, but there are this, these potential you know, downsides. Uh, so again, I just have the definition here again, just to kind of bring it all back. Uh, so we have these ways of acting, thinking, and feeling that are external to us as individuals, but have coercive power over us, and that bind us together. Uh, and so that really in summary, so this uh, brings us back over the last couple of videos. Uh, Durkheim uh, argues that the utilitarians, which we've talked about previously, are wrong because people don't act you know, so-called rationally. Uh, people react emotionally to 
others' violations of the moral order of the collective consciousness. Uh, punishment uh, is a way to reinforce the social order and emerges out of people's uh, kind of collective uh, outrage that they experience uh, toward those who violate the rules. And uh, that moral order exists within the group's collective consciousness, um, which you know is external to the individual and, and is coercive and blah, 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 all the stuff I just said. Uh, so I'm gonna have one more conversation about Durkheim, uh, or not one more conversation about Durkheim, one more Durkheim uh, video that's gonna talk a bit more about social solidarity. Uh, and then we'll move on to the next thing. Uh, but there is, you know, one more aspect of social solidarity, social solidarity uh, that we need to talk about in connection to punishment. So we'll do that, and then we'll move on to uh, we'll move to something beyond Durkheim. So thanks for your time, and I hope you have a fine day.